Thank you to all of you who are joining us. Uh, we've got a bunch of you who are here live on the call and a bunch of you who will be watching the recording afterwards. A uh, big, uh, big hi to all of you. Um, looking forward to connecting over the call. Looking forward to hearing your questions. For today, this is a chance to hear more about the Edmund Hillary Fellowship. And uh, we're recording this call. will be, be shared with those who've, all, all of those who have, um, who have registered, including people who are on the call here right now. So for this call, what I suggest is two parts. First part is me covering off some of the basics of, about the Edmund Hillary Fellowship. Uh, and let's put aside around 15 or 20 minutes for that. And then the remainder of our time we can put aside for hearing uh, your questions. Um, so uh, in terms of you asking your questions, you can do that at any point. The best way to do that is not in the chat window, which we started off uh, uh, for those who are here live. Um, so not the chat window, but to add the Q&A. Uh, you should better see that on your menu. Um, so all of your questions into the Q&A window and do it at any point. I probably won't, I'll probably come to the questions at the end once we've covered off some of the basics about EHF. Um, but keep the questions coming as we go along as well. By way of introduction, my name's Andre robinson Bay. I've been part of the team at EHF for a bit over three years. I joined a little bit before applications closed for our first cohort. Um, and it's been lots of fun and lots of energy and work uh, seeing the community grow over that time from an idea um, to now community of over 250 people and will be significantly larger than that once we've selected cohorts seven and eight. Um, I'm a proud Kiwi, um, brought up here. I'm based in Wellington with my wife and a, um, a two-year-old who's lots of fun. And um, I've got a background as an entrepreneur. Um, and I, for me, part of my journey is trying to bring together the head and the heart. My, uh, my head enjoys strategy and entrepreneurship and business. Always been a, a geek in that direction for a long time and background as an entrepreneur. And uh, my heart is towards wanting to make a positive difference in the world. So for me, being able to connect with and contribute to the EHF community has been a real blessing. For this call, okay, so I'm gonna start by giving a brief rundown about the fellowship, how it works, and um, how you can get benefits from the fellowship. Secondly, we'll talk briefly about New Zealand, why it's a great place to live, a great place to innovate from. Third, how you can get involved. So talking through our application process, uh, including what we select for. And then lastly, but almost more, most importantly, uh, space for your questions. So we'll leave around 40 minutes for that. So let's get started talking about the fellowship. What does being part of the fellowship actually involve? What does it look like if you're offered a place in the fellowship? And how do you get benefits from it? So if you're, and some of this stuff is, uh, will be amended given um, the state of the world with, with COVID as well. Um, so um, in terms of, uh, so when we, sorry, let's go back. Bear with me. <laughs> oh, funny. I'm just gonna stop sharing my screen and I'll do it again in terms of sharing it. I have just, <laughs> I clicked when I shouldn't have, and then I was not able to use the keyboard to move backwards. So I'll just do that again. Apologies, everyone. This is actually the first time that this has happened on one of these calls, just like this. Okay. So for those who are offered a place in the fellowship, uh, you're welcome to New Zealand with your cohort. And that's a really important kind of like base level connection of, of building really strong relationships with others in your cohort. Uh, every six months, there are gatherings. We bring together EHF fellows. Some of them are just for EHF fellows. Some of them might be for your cohort. And some of them are connected with the broader um, innovation ecosystem in New Zealand, where we call those the New Frontiers Summits. There are also regional gatherings. So for example, in Wellington, there's a monthly dinner, different parts of the country, different parts of the world, there are regional gatherings. We, beyond face-to-face, -face, and especially in this COVID world, there are ways of connecting people online. We have a bunch of different platforms, so you can find people working on similar topics, people who are in the same place geographically as you, uh, and people in your cohort. So those are really important, and we're uh, doubling down on our investments in those digital ways of connecting EHF fellows. Uh, and then lastly, in terms of the experience, the EHF team bring, 
team can help provide some support, both in terms of helping you move to New Zealand, but also in terms of um, introductions that might be helpful for the work that you're doing. So what I'd say about all of these is that what, uh, what, the, what, is, the, what is the EHF? So it's not, it's not an accelerator. It's not like a three month period where you have intensive support and then you're out the other end. It's more of a community. Uh, uh, it's for the EHF fellows, our success is your success, but it's by the EHF fellows. A bunch of the benefits and a bunch of the magic from the fellowship comes from the EHF fellows helping connect with and, and support um, each other. Um, and then, then just to add is that with COVID, we'll be figuring out uh, how to how to do these things so especially in terms of in-person events so for our welcome experience we, we plan to do a bunch of stuff digitally digitally um, before people will be welcomed in New Zealand next year who who are applying for cohort eight in terms of benefits of being part of the fellowship there are a few first is the global impact visa and we'll come to it in terms of why it's an attractive visa to access New Zealand secondly is the EHF community um, and we'll, we'll touch on that as well and then thirdly is just open doors so the um, when you come to New Zealand and you say I'm part of the Edmund Hillary Fellowship, that can help open some doors for um, to show that you have been vetted in terms of your character and in terms of your capability. Uh, why EHF? Uh, here are a few quotes from EHF fellows describing why the EHF community has been helpful for them. So I'll give you just a minute to have a quick read through. So as you can see, the benefits are both personal and professional. Personal in that you're helping getting moral support, accountability, and to raise your ambition for what you're doing. Because building a world-changing project or venture is really hard, so you need support from others to help you do that. But there's also, there's also practical support for you and your venture um, in terms of if you're an investor, finding um, others to invest in, if you're a, a change maker or entrepreneur, um, finding uh, talent, finding partners, finding customers, um, and finding uh, uh, funding as well. So there's both practical support for your venture in terms of the, the EHF community, uh, but also personal support as well. Here are some photos from when we welcome to cohort five. Okay, we've talked a bit about the fellowship. So long story short or you know by way of summary so there are a bunch of events both in New Zealand and, and different parts of the world regionally as well as online ways of connecting folks the magic comes from connecting with the EHF fellows and uh, the what I'd say is distinctive about EHF is both New Zealand and the global impact visa um, and the the caliber and um, capability of the people who are part of the fellowship as well next next let's talk about New Zealand I'll go through this quickly so First, the Global Impact Visa. It's an open and flexible visa. So you're able to work, you're able to study, you're able to invest, you're able to build new ventures. You can try something, if it doesn't work, you can pivot and do something different. Your visa is not at risk if you, your Global Impact Visa is not at risk if you end up doing something different to what you thought you would when you first apply. It's flexible in terms of the amount of time you need to spend in New Zealand. There's no minimum number of days that you need to spend here. So it's designed for global citizens who need to travel. If you're accepted and uh, you would, you'd be able to access the Global Impact Visa, your family would, would be able to access family or partner visas. There's a pathway towards permanent residence. So the Global Impact Visa is a three-year work visa. After 30 months on the Global Impact Visa, you can apply for permanent residence, which gives you, you can even vote at that point, it's uh, you know, full access to um, social services, including healthcare and education. It's pretty much everything minus a passport. Uh, and then um, as part of that, you'd need a letter of support from EHF. And for those who are offered a place in the fellowship, we'll give you um, a bunch of documents describing how that process works um, so that you know what you need to do to get EHF support in, in a way that's um, designed to be predictable for you. So you can get points for doing lots of different things, such as building a venture or supporting Kiwi Ventures, connecting the ecosystem here, influencing the ecosystem um, or investing, as well as spending time in New Zealand um, and contributing to the EHF community's impact in New Zealand. So there's a bunch of different ways there, also doing things regionally. So there's a bunch of different ways that you can 
um, you can qualify to get EHF support towards permanent residence after 30 months. Uh, and to access Global Impact Visa, apply to EHF. So in terms of why New Zealand, great place to live. Uh, in terms of civil liberties, uh, low on corruption, high on peace. Uh, also a beautiful place, as you probably know. Uh, lots of ac easy access to great outdoors, clean air. Um, and a great place in terms of culture. So being a leader in lots of different areas, such as in, as in, such as in indigenous relationships, giving women the right to vote, and diversity, generosity, happiness, um, and creativity. So New Zealand's a great place to bring a family. Uh, it's a great place to take risks. Uh, it's a place that's both trusting, community connected, and low in corruption. So you can try things out. People are generally pretty open and, and willing to try new things out. I mean, it has a government which is uh, highly effective. It rates second in the world in terms of the most effective public service. Um, and it can be proportional and reasonable in developing reg regulations, especially in new industries. In terms of scaling ventures, so New Zealand leads the world in terms of ease of doing business. The lack of corruption is another, another plus, both at, uh, for a business, but also as a place where you want to live. New Zealand has strong trade relationships and a highly educated workforce. Next, I'm going to talk about a few New Zealand ventures that have um, been developed from New Zealand. The first is Weta Digital, which um, did the effects for Lord of the Rings and Avatar. And Peter Jackson created the movie industry in New Zealand pretty much from scratch. Xero, which is an online accounting um, software uh, platform, um, they were able to they started in New Zealand and then when they went overseas, they were able to show what they could do when they had the whole of a country connected. And that can be, uh, that can be helpful for other types of entrepreneurs as well. So you could come to New Zealand, you can get a bunch of the market here, and then you can go overseas and say, look, here's what we're doing when we have a large proportion of a country using our product at national scale. So can, New Zealand can be a great test bed for new types of products. It can help you demonstrate what you're doing into other markets. Lanzatech is developing biofuels from steel production process. And lastly, Rocket Lab uh, is putting rocket payloads up into space at, at um, frequent uh, intervals. And the founder of Rocket Lab, Peter Beck, he pretty much created the space industry from scratch in New Zealand. He worked with government. The government helped create a space agency, legislation and other infrastructure to develop New Zealand's um, space industry. Again, an example of New Zealand government being proportional and working with new industries with um, highly proportional and um, attractive regulations. Okay, so we've talked a bit about how the fellowship works. We've talked a bit about New Zealand in terms of why it's a great place to invest and a great place to innovate and live from. Next, how you can get involved with the Edmund Hillary Fellowship. These five things here are really important in terms of how we decide who to select and who to shortlist. Um, and probably a bunch, usually on these calls, a bunch of questions are around what we select for. And usually my answer go, goes back to, it goes back to these selection criteria. Okay, you can also find these on our website at ehf.org forward slash apply. Um, and on our apply page, you can see an, another document that's linked that has more details um, fleshing out these selection criteria along the lines of what I'm going to be covering now. So uh, we select for people, not for projects, but we learn about the people um, from the projects that they work on. So for example, we learn how capable you are or what maybe you prioritize from the projects that you work on. But this is not a, uh, a business plan competition applying to EHF. It's not just, does this venture look good? Because we want to back people like if we give you a visa and then you become a permanent resident in New Zealand, uh, it's a long-term commitment that you could be making to New Zealand and that New Zealand is making to you. Um, so your venture or your plans for your venture, they could come and go, um, but you are the person that we're backing over a long period of time. And there are five key things that we look for uh, in terms of who we select. First is people who are focused on big problems. Um, and ideally in a way that's innovative and scalable. And we recognize that not all problems, especially the important ones, are highly scalable. Second, we're after people who can deliver on their vision. So what we're looking for is evidence of exceptional talent, people who can achieve a lot with a little. There are different ways that we can see that. One easy way is if you've been involved with a high growth venture and you've played a key role in that. 
but there are other ways as well through your voluntary work or your corporate work or your academics um, there could be other ways that we can get a sense of your ability to get a lot done and your your talent we also select people across the spectrum in terms of experience level uh, i think every cohort that we've had we select uh, we've selected people who are um, new to entrepreneurship but for whom we see evidence of being talented so we've selected people in their teenage years as well as people right into their 60s and 70s third we're after people who for whom it, it adds up or it makes sense that you'd want to connect with new zealand both professionally and personally and we can see that you could make a contribution here so for that we'd be looking at things like and you don't necessarily need to have all of these but we'd be looking at things like uh, again, the key question is, does it add up that you would meaningfully connect and contribute to New Zealand? So how we would look at that would be, have you spent time here? What other connections do you have here that you'd, would make sense from a personal and professional point of view? Have you done your research? Um, and um, yeah, th those are the main things. There are some people that spend part of their time in New Zealand and some people that move here full time. If you're gonna move here full time, it makes it easier to connect. If you're gonna be here part time, then you need to be doubly intentional about contributing and connecting to New Zealand. Uh, we have some people that, that maybe they're not ready to move straight away. Maybe they have a key commitment that will mean that they will be, uh, they'll be only able to spend part of their time in New Zealand. So maybe they'll be able to spend more time a bit later on, uh, or maybe, um, maybe they just spend part of their time here, but they, they find high leverage ways to connect and contribute. Fourth, we're up for people who will be active and positive members of the community, the EHF community. So people who will give more than they receive, although it needs to be both. Uh, we're selecting for people who are busy almost by definition because it's people who are doing world changing things. Um, so, uh, so yeah, people who will give, not just to, to take, and people who can sustain relationships over a long period of time. Then fifth, people who will be good ambassadors for New Zealand and the EHF community and um, demonstrate EHF's values, um, which are listed there. Um, and you can find them on our website as well. So for these five things, it's not just a black and white yes or no. Uh, often it's how strongly do you demonstrate these. And, and then lastly, not everyone who's selected or progresses into our deep into our application or selection process is perfect on all of these things. We select for strength, not just for absence of weakness. So if you're particularly strong in a couple of these areas, it could, you could still be a good fit for the fellowship. In terms of key dates, applications close on the 17th of May. Uh, by the way, it's in the world's last time zone at midnight. Uh, and then uh, late fee applications close on the 1st of June. And then our selection process kicks in. Uh, you, you have until September. Um, ideally early September, but uh, uh, the latest is the end of September to submit your Global Impact Visa application. Then we're planning on welcoming Cohort 8 in New Zealand in 2021. Uh, there'll be a bunch of ways that will help to connect and welcome Cohort 8 before then digitally. The, uh, then the fellowship goes from there. Uh, the visas for three years, but our intention and hope is that the EHF community keeps going as long as EHF fellows are wanting to connect with each other. In terms of the selection process, the good news is that everything is online. First step is to submit your online application. Uh, there are shortlisting, there's a shortlisting process at each of these steps. So for those shortlisted, the, there are up to three video interviews. There are reference checks that are done online. So we, might, um, we would reach out to you at that point to ask for references of people who know you well, who have worked with you perhaps. Um, and then lastly, it's our independent selection panel that makes the final decision about who's offered a place in the fellowship. Go to ehf.org forward slash apply. You can find more information there about fees in terms of the, the fees for entrepreneurs, for investors, there are discounts for New Zealanders. Um, and there are, there is a, a fee payable when you apply. So when you submit your application, there's also a fee payable uh, if you're accepted into the fellowship, sorry, if you're offered a place in the fellowship and you accept that offer. Um, if you apply today, for example, or you know, before the 1st of June, 
Um, if you're shortlisted through the selection process, you can request a scholarship for the fee that you pay if you're offered and then accept a place in the fellowship. So key dates, co-ordinated applications close on the 17th of May and we're accepting late fee applications. So it's a slightly higher price. Um, and you can see the details on our website in terms of um, the pricing. Uh, between the 17th of May, rather the 18th of May, um, and the 1st of June. And we'll be welcoming cohort eight in early 2021. Uh, one other important thing to add, and we're, we're pretty much done actually, we are done, uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of EHF and EHF 101. Um, so a key thing to add is that cohort eight is the last confirmed cohort. So originally when EHF was created, um, the government agreed to having a four-year pilot for the visa, but also committed to EHF for seven years. So for those who are selected now, um, your visa goes for three years. Um, again, our, our hope and expectation um, and intention is that the EHF community will keep continuing um, beyond even when we're issuing new visas. And the visa policy will be reviewed by Immigration NZ's policy team next year. Uh, and we're, we're hopeful that they'll want to continue with the visa after that. But at this point, we don't have uh, any, we don't have confirmation right now that, that the visa will be continued or what, how it might be changed um, if, it, if and when it's, um, it's offered again. So I think that's it from me in terms of some of the basics about EHF. Now we're gonna cover off your questions. So we've got 18 questions, which is great. Um, and so I'll, I'll go through them and do keep the questions coming as well. Pretty much we'll keep going until we hit the hour or until we run out of questions. So question from Anul, how many, how many applications did you receive for the batch eight so far? How many was it for batch seven? Um, so what I'll say is that we usually have around, uh, and just to add as well in terms of questions, if you could add your questions into the Q&A window. Uh, not the chat window, but the Q&A window, um, just so that I'll be able to make sure that I can answer your question. Excuse me, so we typically have a couple of hundred applications per cohort. So for example, for cohort seven, we had um, a bit under 500 people who applied. Um, for cohort eight, applications are still open. Um, and, and so it's really hard to know what the total number will be. Um, question from Sean, regarding the investor visa in addition to the, uh, the 24,000 NDD as part of the offer, that's actually uh, the price is actually different to that, but worthwhile you checking on the website as well. Um, how much do you need to invest over the course of three years and any other criteria to the program for investors? Um, so thanks, Sean. So the, the key thing I asked is, I hear from your question is what, what do you need to invest over, uh, over the course of three years? Um, so what I'd say is that there's no, there's no mandate. Like there are other types of visas where you have to put, for example, you know, three million or one and a half million dollars into particular, um, particular types of assets um, as the conditions of the visa. So for the global impact visa, there's no mandatory re requirement. But I mentioned before about the, uh, the global impact visa being a three year visa and there being a pathway towards permanent residence. So there are different ways to get EHF support for permanent residence and there's a points based system that you can see what you need to do. You can, one of the ways that you can get points is through investing. Um, and it's not just the dollar amounts that you invest, it's also around how much value you add to those companies. And for example, whether you're leading a round or um, you know, the, the, if you're investing 10 angel checks of $10,000 each, can, um, then arguably that can add more value to just one late stage investment of 100,000. So it's not just based on dollar size, it's more based on, uh, and there's criteria there that specifies it, but. Um, how much value are you adding to the ecosystem through those investments and through not just the cash that you give or not give but invest um, but also the value that you add through your connections and your skills. Um, thanks for that question Sean. Question from Anud. If you've never been to New Zealand what what are your chances of being accepted? In other words what's the percentage of fellows accepted without having been in New Zealand before? Okay so there long story short we have accepted a bunch of people who haven't yet been to New Zealand. Uh, what I'd say is it's more common that we have people who have been to New Zealand. Well, we actually have Kiwis who are part of the fellowship as well as internationals. Um, so, but, but it's, not a, it's not a showstopper. 
that if you have not yet been to New Zealand, the key question that we ask is, does it make sense? Again, does it make sense from a business point of view and a personal point of view? Um, so you could have a bunch of reasons why it would make sense for you to connect with New Zealand. And there's a bunch of stuff you can do to show that you're serious about it without actually um, having spent time on the ground here. I mean, hey, all our sequel, if you've spent a bunch of time here, that's a positive, but it's by no means mandatory. Question from Rebecca. We have one NZ founder and one non-NZ citizen in one team. What are the pros and cons of applying individually versus applying as a team? Does NZ have a preference? Okay, so um, I, think, I think there's a couple of parts to the question there. So with regards to whether it makes sense to apply individually or together as a team, so what in terms of what we look at for teams we look at we look at the team members individually and say how strong do each of those individuals fit with against our selection criteria as well as saying you know how do you how do you work combined you know how do your skills complement for example um so whether so for example there, there, there have been a small number of cases where we've had a few people in a team apply and there's been one person that's been a really strong fit and another person that's been less of a fit. Um, so in that case, we've, we have, um, in a few cases, but not that many, we've said, um, we've been able to differentiate and say, we see it's really strong fit with this person, but not with the other person. So I guess if you were to apply as a team, that lowers the risk that you would, you would um, lose your chance, if you like, if there's one person that's particularly stronger. Uh, in terms of having an NZ founder and, and a non-NZ, so, Currently, the way the pricing form works is um, th uh, there's a price for there's not a, there's not currently a price being shown for uh, for that mixture of international and, and Kiwi. So, uh, what I suggest you do is that you email applications at ehf.org, um, and they can help uh, help you figure out a way to find a price that makes sense given that you have one paying the international price and one who's paying the New Zealand price. Question from another question from Anu. Can you share more about the path to residency? Okay, so uh, I think I've mentioned it a bit, um, but what I'd say beyond what I've mentioned is that what I, uh, it's a really attractive pathway compared to other visa categories. So a bunch of other visa categories have a really strict set of criteria about what you need to do to get residence, uh, permanent residence. So it might be, you know, minimum amount of dollars you need to invest or you need to create a business that creates strong outcomes and so basically it's it's uh, and and often there are requirements for you to be in country for a certain number of days um and it's what i'd say is it's 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 more there are a set number of ways that you can uh that you that you need to do to get residence whereas with the global impact visa uh it offers a, a lot of flexibility both in terms of the global impact visa itself um, as well as the the, the points-based system um, for your getting EHF support. So there are seven different ways that you can generate points. So um, what it means is that you're not just focused on does my business work or what, what outcomes am I creating for my business? There are lots of different ways that you can add value. So it gives you flexibility in terms of finding ways to contribute meaningfully to New Zealand, um, uh, rather than just, just our intention is not, not for it intention is for it to be wide so that there are lots of different ways that you can meaningfully contribute rather than just doing things to to, to meet the points another question from my note how long is the residency in nz in some countries permanent residence of five years renewable visa okay so so it's a it's so you go from the global impact visa which is a three-year visa towards permanent residence and that permanent word is the the answer there so it's for the rest of your life so again it's pretty much like being a citizen minus having a part a, minus having a passport you can vote in new zealand elections access um social services question from Alain: say i love new zealand and what ehf provides with COVID 19 i've been impacted financially i understand the scholarship deadline has expired has there been an extension of the scholarship so thanks Alain. so again like i mentioned before i think i've covered this already so um the scholarship is passed for the fee that you pay when you apply um but you can if you apply you can request a scholarship towards the fee that you'd pay if you're offered a place and accept your place in the fellowship. Question from Emmeline. Do you have tips regarding the application video? What do you want to see? And can we read some parts of it out? <laughs> uh, thanks, Emmeline. So, Emily, rather. Uh, so what I'd say is that 
in the application form, there's a few do's and don'ts. There are a few suggestions about what to do and what not to do. So those, those are the, the most relevant and up-to-date guide rather than my, my recollection of it. Um, uh, what I'd say is that we're wanting to get to know you. It's not, it's not based on who can create the most compelling video in terms of special effects or in terms of it being a smooth pitch uh, that's polished with professional cutting and, and video quality. Um, so it's, it's just us trying to get a sense of you, why you're interested in the fellowship and a bit about what led you to apply and why you want to connect with New Zealand. Um, so it's those sorts of things. Again, have a look on the, on the um, apply page for more, more colour than what I've mentioned there in more detail. So another question from Anu, can you share some of the best profiles you've admitted so far? So you can actually see who's been offered a place in the fellowship already. Uh, actually, funnily enough, if you go on YouTube and type in EHF application, you'll be able to find a few videos from other people who have applied but have made their videos public. Um, so that's an idea, both for the, for the previous two questions. Um, but in terms of, um, if you go to ehf.org and then click on the, the link up at the top right on the menu that says fellowship, you'll be able to look through and see the profiles of EHF fellows. So that's a great way to get a sense of who we have accepted. Question from Anod. What would be two or three profiles you'd like to have in batch eight? Uh, my answer there would be, it all goes back to our selection criteria. So if you're a strong fit on those, then um, that's, um, that's what we're after. Uh, it's, not, it's not that we have, so, um, so for example, we don't have, oh, this is a blockchain cohort, or this is our environment cohort, or this is our digital tech cohort. Um, we, we select for people who are a great fit for the fellowship based on our selection criteria. Having said that, as we've got more and more people in the fellowship, there are some clusters that emerge. And, um, but again, we're, just, we're open for people who do all sorts of different types of things as long as they'll contribute meaningfully. Um, uh, but uh, we're also interested in how do we, once we have people part of the fellowship, like how do, we, how do we engage them in terms of working on particular problems that are relevant to New Zealand's uh, challenges to New Zealand's unique capabilities as well. So an example would be New Zealand to set, set an ambitious deadline or a goal of being predator free by 2050. How can, that's one area, how can EHF fellows contribute to eliminating um, pests in New Zealand through technology? That's an example, but there are a bunch more than that. So another question from Rebecca, I'm also correct that if we apply as a team, we just need one application. So that is correct. So if you apply as a team, one application form, there's a space in the application form when you can select team to give more details about your other team members. Question from Anu, did Naval Ravkan really apply? Yes, he really applied and is part of the fellowship. Question from uh, Tuatini. At the moment, I do not have any venture idea, but if there's a pre-existing one for which I could contribute my skills and expertise, artificial intelligence and computer vision, and I'm willing to devote a bit of my time on meaningful projects, but I can't become a full-time job since I already have one. Is this something you'd consider as a valid contribution? Thanks, um, Tortini. So again, it goes back to our selection criteria. It's not, a, it's not a startup idea competition. It's not a business plan competition. It's people that are values fit who are going to contribute meaningfully to the fellowship and to New Zealand. Uh, if you have the skills and the capability and the inclination to do that, then you could be a really strong fit. It's not based on, do you have a business idea? And, and um, so, But having said that, we'll be looking at what's your capability to execute, as I mentioned before. Um, if you have experience, of, if you have evidence of that, then uh, from previous things you've done, then what you're planning on working now is, is even less important. Um, but yeah, we, we do look for evidence to get a sense of people's ability to execute, people's people being talented. Another question from Anud. How many people reached the first shortlist? How many reached the second? How many reached the final? Um, so what would I say there? So it's maybe of those who reached the first shortlist, it's somewhere probably between around 30, 40%, even as much as half for some cohorts. We don't have a set number. So it's not like we have, you know, um, quotas, uh, it's more just who do we see who's a really strong fit uh, through the different shortlisting gates. Any links allow me to recommend someone to the fellowship? Uh, actually in the application form, there's a section where you can recommend others. 
another question if you reapplied are you taking into account the previous application um, so we've had people who've applied uh, multiple times and then been successful in the end uh, we've had people who've applied uh, three or maybe even more than three times and have been successful so what I'd say is that our job is to uh, say if you've applied in the past and you apply again uh, our job is to be aware of our view when you applied uh, but also to have an open mind about what's changed and uh, we for those who apply and request that we give feedback so there's space for you to get a sense of of where you stood and um, and maybe what things that you could do that could strengthen your fit with the fellowship as well question from christopher how do you consider international applicants who have not been to new zealand yet we've covered that one already thank you for that question christopher question from roger how can the fellowship help someone grow as a person slash leader could you please give some examples of the activities each cohort does together um how could it help someone grow as a personal leader so i guess i guess my question back would be um actually funnily enough when i during the application process we we um for those who are shortlisted interviews we ask to hear people's journeys people's stories and often through that you end up learning that in a person's life often there are key people that are really influential so to the extent that you build strong relationships as part of the, the fellowship they can be really influential to you um there are different working groups on different topics um and so if you're going to wanting to be a take a leadership position in a particular field you can um build your network and build your skills in a particular area um examples of activities that cohort each cohort does together so what i'd say is that the welcome experience when you first join is really important it's an intensive period where you really quickly build trust with others who are part of your cohort beyond that there are for example some cohorts there are zoom calls that are on a regular or semi-regular basis for you to reconnect um, ways of connecting online as well what i'd say is that over a period of time like when you start your relationship with your cohort is the foundational thing over time you start building relationships with other ehf fellow members across different cohorts so in some ways over time you probably build friendships beyond your cohort and end up um, in many cases building strong um, connections across and across in, you know within your industry as well so uh, if you're a storyteller you build strong connections with others and, and share ideas and projects for example question from peter if selected how can we find other fellows with similar experiences or passions that we could work with so uh, we have online platforms to help people connect different working groups in different subject areas so that would be a really easy way to find people working on similar things or you know similar place to you as well if you're in the same city question from christopher if we want to come to new zealand this fall prior to ehf fellowship what are the current government regulations regarding this will it cause problems of the ehf process if we apply for a short-term nz visa um so i guess i mean it depends if you mean the new zealand fall or the northern hemisphere fall i'm guessing you mean the northern hemisphere fall which would be like september so what i'd say is that there's a bunch of uncertainty just right now uh, in terms of um, COVID-19 and um, so currently the border is closed so we expect that I would expect that that would be open there may be some quarantining at some point as well just depending on where testing's at so basically there's oh sorry I just whacked my keyboard um, basically there's a there's uncertainty right now in terms of the border um, if you there are some people that maybe apply for their who there are some people who that maybe are in the process of applying to EHF but they come on a visitor visa uh, and that's that's okay um you can if you're accepted in the fellowship there are people that know more about visas than i do and can help provide some sort of advice or support around um people being on different visas at the same time how that works if you have a visitor visa and a global impact visa let me a question from reina uh is my ehf scholarship still available got an email that your scholarship had been successful and was given a scholarship price dated 25 march okay so uh, if you were offered a scholarship there's the window for you to apply using that scholarship price for the for the fee you pay when you apply that is now passed but um, given that your scholarship application was successful if you apply you need to apply with the reg at the regular price 
but if you're offered a place in the fellowship, you can get a, a significant, a, you know, very substantial discount on that, that fee that you pay at that time. And the next question is, if yes, is the deadline of payment still on or before 1 June? Can you request an extension based on the economic situation? Three, my application is still for cohort seven or eight. So if you applied for a scholarship for cohort eight, then you would apply for cohort eight. Basically, I'd say if you haven't, if you had applied for cohort seven already, you would know that you'd applied, I expect. Um, so I'm guessing that you would be applying for cohort eight. Um, uh, if if you are still unsure, email applications at ehf.org. Uh, and then in terms of timing, so if you apply for cohort eight, you'd pay the fee payable when you submit your application. If you're offered a place in the fellowship, that would be in sometime in August. So it would be in August that you'd pay your, uh, your fee. Um, we don't want money to be a barrier at that point. If there are reasons why you uh, you can't make all of that payment at once, then we can have a conversation to try and figure out what would be, what would be fair and what can, uh, what can help. Question from Tuatini. Is there a guarantee that my partner could get a family visa when not married? If accepted into the program, considering you've been able to prove that you've been together for the past five years. Okay, so first thing I'd say is that I'm not, a, not an expert on partner visas, but uh, it's more, from what I know, it, I, I'm pretty sure it's more based on your being together other than whether you're married um, or both, you know, there's different pathways. It would, would be my sense, but uh, even better than my guess, uh, informed guess would be to go into the Immigration NZ website, just type in Immigration New Zealand Partner Visa, and then that'll give you their definitions. Question from Tuatini, what's the appropriate rate at which I should physically come to New Zealand if I get accepted? I'm a digital nomad, so I can come to New Zealand as needed. So again, there's no, there's no minimum requirement according to the Global Impact Visa. Um, so you can, um, thanks from Sam. Um, Sam, I think you're saying you need to duck out. Um, good, um, good to connect, Sam. Hope that that was helpful. You'll better get the recording that we'll have more of the question, more of the Q&A beyond here as well. Um, so back to the question from Tuatini. So, so how much time you spend in New Zealand, it's up to you is the short answer. Uh, so, I mean, I, we hope that people will spend, we hope that people will contribute. If it's easier for you to contribute by spending more time here, then that's fantastic. But we have some of, some EHF fellows contribute a lot whilst only being here for a number of weeks a year. But again, it requires intentionality. Question from um, Sanjeevan. Sanjeevan. Hello, what happens to the 24K paid at the second stage as an investor? Do we have any say on whether it's on where it is applied, or is it the nature of the application expenses? Um, thanks, um, Sanjavin. Um, apologies if I'm pronouncing your name incorrectly. Um, so, I'm not sure if I understand your question. Uh, you're asking, do you have any say over where it's applied? So, what I'd say is that, okay, so the fee that you pay when you, if you're offered a place in the fellowship and accept it. Um, you, you only pay that if you want to take up your place in the fellowship. So uh, if you decide that you don't want to be part of the fellowship, then you, you wouldn't need to pay it. Uh, what I'd say about the fee that you pay when you are offered and accept a place in the fellowship is that it, it, helps, uh, it helps towards providing the costs of the fellowship program. Um, I hope that that answers your question. Feel free to send a follow-up if need be. Question from Tuatini. If I get accepted into the cohort, will my partner apply directly for a family visa or does she have to wait 30 months? She'll be able to apply once I get my permanent residence. So, so if you, Tuatini, if you got the Global Impact Visa, your partner would get a partner visa. They'd better get that straight away. You know, they'd better get that at the same time um, as you. You can, either, you can either apply for your Global Impact Visa by yourself and then your partner apply for a partner visa later or you can apply concurrently. So you'd get them at the same time. But in long story short, your partner wouldn't have to wait for 30 months. You could apply and, and, uh, and get it much earlier than that. Question from Josh. What's the rate of NGOs versus nonprofit ventures uh, in the EHF? Is the program geared towards a certain structure? Um, so what I'd say, I don't have exact figures about what's the split. Uh, we do have a bunch of each of them. Um, 
I guess part of the design is, uh, even though in the name, right, the Global Impact Visa is based on people who can make a positive impact. And, and that in includes social, environmental, cultural, as well as economic. Um, so I hope that answers that question. Um, and have a look through our website in terms of profiles of people who are part of the fellowship. We've got people, a bunch of people doing international development work, um, environmental work, storytelling, healthcare, like there's a whole bunch of different things from futurists to farmers and everything in between. Another question from Josh. Oh, actually, actually, that was the same one. Uh, to attend, am I guaranteed to be able to come, come and go to New Zealand and or stay for an extended period of time with my partner if I accepted into the cohort? Okay, so if you, if you apply for and get accepted and, and get your global impact visa and activate it, then um, other, everything other than COVID, just because COVID creates uncertainties around visas and borders and things, other than COVID, um, uh, you're able to come and go as much as you, you like. Um, I'm pretty sure that's the case for your partner as well. Uh, that would depend on the conditions of the partner visa, which I'm not an expert on. So worthwhile checking the conditions of partner visas. But the Global Impact Visa has no in-country requirements. A lot of other visas, they say you need to be in-country for 200 days a year or 180 days a year. Global Impact Visa, zero in terms of the number of days you need to spend here. So it's, um, it enables you to come and go. Obviously, we hope that you spend more. Coming and joining Welcome Week involves days in the country. Um, but it's, it's really flexible. Question from Mauricio. What's the total number of applicants for cohort seven? Covered that one already. It was a bit over, a bit under 500 people. Uh, question from uh, Adewale. Apologies if I'm not pronouncing that correctly. What's the ratio of, ratio of percentage of selected um, candidates compared to applicants? So maybe an example is cohort six. So we had just under 400 people apply for that and we selected 65, so that's a bit over 15%. We don't have a fixed ratio. Uh, if, if you're someone who we think is a strong fit with the fellowship, then uh, we would shortlist you. And, um, but it's not, uh, there's no fixed number. It's not like we have to accept one in X. If, if everyone who applied we thought was a fantastically strong fit, um, then Actually, we have a, <laughs> there is a cap on the number of visas we've got, but we have a lot more Global Impact visas. So we're, we're currently unconstrained by the number of visas. Another question from Mauricio. How many of them will be shortlisted? Okay, I think we've covered that off already. Question from Arvind. While uploading additional material, can you combine two documents into one using PDF merge? Uh, you, sure, you're welcome to combine documents however you want to and upload them. Up to you. Question from Josh. What opportunities exist to access philanthropic slash donors? Sorry, to access philanthropic donors slash funders. Okay, so in New Zealand, there are a bunch of government grants available. There are a bunch of philanthropic foundations that provide grants. Uh, it's the specifics are particular to each provider. So if I'm a grant provider A, grant provider B, government grant provider C, they each have their own categories and definitions and requirements. So it's worthwhile looking into each of them to get a sense of whether you'd be a fit. But in short, New Zealand does have philanthropic funding. Question from Sanjeev. Reference B7 of application form. Would investments made on behalf of organization in setting up a new, a new initiative count, e.g. budget, budget alloc allocations for developing new business lines? Okay, so in general, how we think about it is uh, if you are, so what it says, if you are building a venture in New Zealand, then applying as an entrepreneur makes sense. If you're going to help support the ecosystem through investing your time and talent, um, either through writing checks or b building the ecosystem in different ways, then investor could make sense. So your question was around the investor application form and what you need to do to, to show um, the dollars that you're making for investment. So usually in that form, you would be, it would be investments you've made into other ventures. If you've got a venture and you're investing your money into it, that sounds like an entrepreneurial activity. Um, Having said that, if you're a CFO of a large company and you have expertise in allocating capital, then I guess that gives us, that could give us an, an indication. I mean, Warren Buffett, for, for goodness sake, um, allocates capital for Berkshire Hathaway. So I guess in one sense, he's directly allocating capital, capital within his own company. So, uh, yep, so I hope that answers that. Another question from San, uh, Sanjivan, Sanjivan, sorry. Um, and 
question B8 from the application form. Do you necessarily have to be an institutional investor to apply as an investor? Short answer, no. So a bunch of people who apply are angel investors. Um, we're lo what we're looking for is not just, are you part of a firm? We're not just looking at how much money you have. We're looking at what do we expect you contributing to New Zealand? How active are you gonna be? How are you gonna add value? Part of that's through your resources, but, but resources are not just money, it's time and talent and connections. Question from Amor. Would my kids have free access to public schools after having the Global Impact Visa? Okay, so you would have the Global Impact Visa if you got in, uh, got accepted, and your children would be able to be there as part of, um, as part of family visa. I, I'm not sure. I, I think that your children would have access to public schools in New Zealand, but it's worthwhile you double checking that on the Immigration NZ website. I know that people who have the Global Impact Visa can access education facilities. Um, but it's worthwhile checking for your kids. A uh, question from Adewale. I'm going to have some more dogs. I'm being thirsty. Um, does EHF consider exceptional skill of applicants and not only entrepreneurship tendency? Um, so what I'd say is that, uh, what I'd say is we're out for people who can make a meaningful contribution to New Zealand, to, its, to New Zealand's ecosystem. Uh, innovation ecosystem. So building a venture here is one, advising, supporting, connecting, influencing, uh, investing in the ecosystem, those are other ways. Uh, check out our apply page and there's a link down the bottom of section one of the apply page which is about selection criteria. Has, and it mentions those five things which I've just rattled off really quickly then. Um, so if you're able to contribute strongly in those areas, one or more of those areas, then you could be a good fit. You don't have to build a venture here. There are a bunch of ways that you can contribute. You're being talented and being able to show talent in different directions and ways can give us a sense of that. So I hope that answers that question. Question from Josh. Can you clarify opportunities to access scholarships to cover the costs? Um, so I've covered that off already. Uh, and then on an ongoing basis for EHF events, there also the, there's also the ability to, to um, access scholarships as well. I'm just gonna have some more. Thanks, I know. So your question is around the seven ways to get points for residency. Okay, so just to just let me describe as well. So if you have the Global Impact Visa, then you apply for permanent residence. You need three things. There could be more than this, but here are the three main ones. Police check, medical check, and EHF's letter of support. EHF has a point system to figure out who it gives its letter of support to. And the seven ways that you can contribute points to that. And again, if you're offered a place in the fellowship, you'll get sent um, documents with lots of details that we're to specify it. So one, building a venture. Two, supporting New Zealand ventures. Uh, so it could be, you know, being in a mentor or a board member or advisor. Um, three, connecting the ecosystem. So providing valuable introductions, for example, or connecting New Zealand institutions with international institutions. Four, influencing the ecosystem. Um, that could be building new industries or it could be, you know, providing the foundation for new industries, or it could be um, helping contribute to New Zealand's policy environment. And the last one is investing. So investing, um, investing capital. And um, so those are five, and they fit with the five main ways that the government monitors or rather evaluates EHF. Then the other two are spending time in New Zealand and lastly, contributing to New Zealand's regions. Um, Question from Christopher. What do you look for in references in terms of number, who that'd be? What do you want references to, to demonstrate? Thanks, Christopher. So first thing to say is that you don't need to provide references when you first apply. They come down the line if you're shortlisted. Uh, but in that case, I think it's between four and six, I think, that we ask for. And we give a bit more guidance at that point in terms of who we're after. But it's, again, it goes back to our selection criteria. So we're asking questions that tries to um, tries to unpack those five things to get a sense of your strength in those areas. Question from Marcos. In the payment part of the application form, if you select a team of two, there's a US dollar, thousand dollar charge. Uh, does this apply to both members? If yes, team member two, do not pay. Okay, so for international entrepreneurs, up until close of play, uh, you know, midnight on the 17th of May, 
in the world's last time zone. So currently it's 500 US dollars per person. So if you apply with one, that's 500. If you apply with two, it's a thousand. If you apply with three, it's 1500. So if you apply with three, uh, let's just use two because you use that example. If you apply with two, it's 1000 in total. You'd make one payment through a PayPal or a MasterCard or whatever, um, credit card, whatever type of payment options are available. So you make one payment. So maybe if you have two people, maybe you make the payment and your friend, your co-applicant pays you to reimburse you for half of it. That's an example. Question from Josh. If one does not apply this round, it was not accepted. When do you anticipate the next cohort round, assuming the EHF continues after this cohort? Um, so long story short is we don't know. Uh, we're expecting the policy will be reviewed next year, uh, but it could be a while. Um, it's, out, it's out of our control directly. Um, even when the, it gets the green light, then it could be some time um, to ramp up in terms of attracting people and in terms of running through the application process. So it could be, could be late next, could be late 2021, could be later. It's hard to know. Question from Marcos. If we apply as a team, one application form for each or both. We've covered that already. Thanks, Marcos. So one per team. Question from Pablo. Do you have experience going through the health criteria with HIV diagnostic? If this is a cause to rejection for the process to get a global impact visa. Um, thanks, Pablo. So what it says, do a Google search for Immigration New Zealand Global Impact Visa. And then on that, it lists the conditions of the visa, including health. And you'll be able to get, if you follow your nose, you'll be able to find their guidance documents that describe what health requirements they have. Question from Rodolfo, what's the time zone for application deadline? So it's the last time zone in the world. So I don't know if it's American Samoa or somewhere around there. So it's New Zealand's the first country in the world to have a new day. So it's on the slightly other side of the time zone. So somewhere in the, somewhere in the middle of the Pacific, basically. Hawaii or a bit over. Anyway, there's a, there's, a, um, there's, a, there's a clock on the application form as well. Um, so... And at the moment, it will tell you how many days, but when you get close to the deadline, it will tell you how many hours. So that will give you the answer. Question from Christopher. How long are the later stage interviews and what is the interview format? Um, so we'll cover that off if you're shortlisted. It's the short answer, but excuse me. So the first interview is a short one, like 15, 20 minutes. Excuse me, the second one is around 45 to an hour, 45 minutes to an hour, and the last one is around 20 minutes. Uh, and the second one it would be with two people at EHF's end. Uh, and more details if you're shortlisted in terms of what to expect. Question from Sanjeevan. Sanjeevan, sorry. I read that as investor, you could contribute with investment advice networks. How does that advise networks part work out? Do you need prior research contacts who you will advise on what issues? Or do you get paid partially for advisory? Okay, so what I'd say is that, okay, if you're accepted a place, if you're offered and accept a place in the fellowship, a bunch of this stuff would be made a bit more clear a bit down the track. So in terms of how you would go about finding companies to invest in or ventures to invest in or mentor or advise, um, the EHF community has some connections that could be really helpful. So uh, if you went onto, onto the community portal and asked the people to be able to give you advice about who are, the, who are the early stage companies in New Zealand that would value from your advice, then um, you, know, you could get pointed in the right direction. Uh, with you, what you get paid for that, it depends. So there's no like, EHF doesn't provide a set rate, it's more just a commercial negotiation between you and others. Question from Peter, hi Peter. Some NZ visas have fixed age limits of 55. Does the EHF have an age limit policy? And have you had older fellows than this? So I mentioned before, our oldest EHF fellows are in the 60s or 70s. We don't have an, a formal age limit. We're, we're looking at what people can contribute. Now, if you're 115 and you're in your bed permanently, then that probably makes it harder, harder to find that could make it harder for you to find ways to contribute. That's just an edge case, a ridiculous edge case. Um, so, but, um, so if you're older, we're looking at your experience, how much your propensity is to give and help 
give back to others, how much energy you've got in the tank to keep building things or supporting others along the way. So long story short, there's no, it all goes back to our selection criteria again is the answer there. So the question we ask is, do we see you contributing meaningfully to New Zealand and the fellowship? There are a bunch of people we've selected who are older because we see them being able to contribute meaningfully. Question from Rihanna, uh, or Rihanna, I'm not sure if how I pronounce that, sorry. Age safe, uh, thank you for answering my questions, clearly Andre. Great, thank you. Question from Carlos, how do I know if I'm a qualified applicant for? Um, so, uh, mentioning what I mentioned before, so go to ehf.org forward slash apply. Section one under there is the selection criteria. Read through that, we've covered that off already. And then there's a document linked down the bottom of that, bottom of section one, just under the bullet points that, ha that gives more detail on what we select for. It covers a bunch of the stuff we've discussed. So that will hopefully give you a good sense. And then the other piece would be worthwhile looking through profiles of people who have applied and been accepted into the fellowship. You can find that on our, on our, on our website, on the fellowship page on, on ehf.org, uh, and they'll give you a sense as well. Next question from Christopher, is there a difference in acceptance rates for entrepreneurs versus investors? Uh, what I'd say is it's not, we don't have a set policy, right? Not like we say X percent for investors, X percent for, invest for entrepreneurs. What I'd say is probably it tends up being, it probably ends up being higher, a higher acceptance rate for investors because typically people who are investors are more, um, have more, um, it, all else in general, they probably tend to be more experienced. Um, so it can be more clear to see what they can contribute. Question from Anod. Yeah, Chef has now has 261 fellows over a quarter of 400. Are you looking to have more than 60 fellows in the cohort eight? So thanks Anod. So EHF has north of 260 fellows, but a bunch of those are Kiwis or maybe a few Australians, for example. So the number of global impact visas out of our total of 400 that we've allocated is I think a bit over 200. So we've got another bit under 200 left to go across two cohorts, cohort seven and eight. Um, so basically we are currently unconstrained or, or it's not a binding constraint in terms of the number of visas that we have. Uh, we all select people based on, again, those that we see as being a strong fit. Um, that 400 number is not a target, um, but if we have a large number of people we see who are a great fit with the fellowship, then, uh, then we'll select them. Question from Rainer. What will happen if I paid the application fee and was not selected in the fellowship? Is the, is the 500 US dollars fundable? Um, so the, the fee you pay when you apply to EHS, uh, that's not refundable. A bit, a bit little bit about the rationale for that is that that fee helps cover the costs of EHF attracting people to join and also to help cover the costs of the selection process. Question from Sean, can you purchase a home with this visa? Do you need to rent during the duration of the visa program? Uh, thank you. Okay, so uh, you to purchase a property in New Zealand, you need to have a residence visa. The global impact visa is a, a work visa. So, uh, so my understanding, and I'm I'm not an expert on the legislation here, but my understanding is that when you become a permanent resident, again, it's pretty much like being a citizen. You can purchase the property at that point. Um, there are different ways to, there are different ways to purchase property, but there are there are different processes. So, for example, there's a thing with the Overseas Investment Office, um, and you need to show certain criteria in order to get, uh, in order to get, um, get permission for it. So, I hope that answers it. So, most people who join the fellowship uh, rent during a period and then are in a position to buy property um, if they're offered permanent residence. So, uh, Vignesh, can someone with a startup idea apply for EHF or should it be an established entity? I think we've covered this off already. So, it goes back to our selection criteria. It's not a startup idea or a, or a business plan competition. Um, if you've been able to, sh so the question you're getting to there is your, your ability to deliver on your vision. So, if you've shown your ability to achieve a lot with a little, then the current idea of what you think about doing is a lot less relevant. We select people, not ventures. Question from Vignesh, I have multiple ideas, do I need to apply separate applications? So short answer, you can only submit one application per person. So there's space for you to write, describe different ideas in the same application form. Question from Emma, what are my chances to get a government grant for your, for my venue? Uh, 
I can't answer that because I don't allocate government grants. Um, so, but what I would say is, um, what I would say is worthwhile looking at, do research for government grants um, and then see how your, what you're doing fits with the criteria. That would be the way to find it out. But I don't know enough about the criteria about to answer that or what you're working on. Um, question from uh, Vignesh. If I have extensive experience, uh, yes, um, in, for example, a skill shortage area, uh, and I could support other startup companies, would I be eligible? Again, it goes back to our selection criteria. I think we've covered this stuff off already. Um, and, and look at that document that's linked in our, at the bottom of our, uh, in our apply page, just under selection criteria. We'll describe the different ways you can contribute as part of the fellowship. Another question from Anil. Uh, thanks a lot of your time in answering all of our questions. Now time for us to reflect more on how we can contribute to New Zealand. <laughs> cool, thank you, Anil. So we've had 59 questions. Whew. Uh, thanks everyone and going to finish up the call shortly unless there are any final ones coming through. Just looking through some of the chats, but again, I'll cover off the Q and A rather than the chats. Cool. Thanks. I think, I think that's us ladies and gentlemen. One last question from someone. Am I able to bring my parents to New Zealand? Can I still apply for any scholarship? I think we've covered that in terms of scholarships. Uh, can you bring your parents to New Zealand? Uh, I'm not sure if you mean permanently or temporarily. Uh, if it's temporarily, then getting a visitor visa is usually pretty easy, unless you're coming from North Korea or certain countries. Um, but if I wanted to permanently live here, then, then um, it's worthwhile you looking at the visa requirements, given their circumstances. Great. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for the, thanks for all the questions. We have 60 questions, which is a pretty good, pretty good, uh, pretty good effort if you ask me. Um, so it's been great to connect with you. Great to hear your questions. Key dates, 17th of May for cohort eight applications, the last confirmed cohort to EHF. And then from the 18th of May to the 1st of June, we're accepting late fee applications. If you, from hearing this, if you think you're a good fit for the fellowship, if you, if it sounds interesting for you, um, do more research. And um, if you think it's a good fit, I encourage you to apply. Uh, and if so, look forward to learning more about you through the application process. Thanks everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day. Uh, rest of your day. Stay safe. Kaikatano. <laughs>